This lecture is about the academic terminology critical race theory. This is University Quick Course. Although, as a concept, it has been around for over 40 years, critical race theory has recently become a controversial topic. This topic exploded in the public arena, especially in K-12, where numerous state legislatures debated bills seeking to ban its use in the classroom. In this modern context, when considering this terminology, a bifurcated set of questions quickly emerge. Is critical race theory a way of understanding how American racism has shaped public policy, or is it a divisive discourse that pits people of color against white people? These questions have caused sharp disagreements among ideologically dissimilar groups. While it is tempting to say that critical race theory has been suddenly thrust upon us by political leaders, political parties, and other actors and events such as those surrounding the formation of groups like Black Lives Matter, the murder of George Floyd, and the protests surrounding it, all of these events and more have merely increased public awareness about issues that have been around for generations, like housing segregation and discrimination, the impact of criminal justice policy, and indeed, the legacy of the enslavement of black Americans. In this light, two of the central questions in the debate over critical race theory are what is the role of government in righting these past wrongs, and how do schools and teachers address these past wrongs in a way that is factually appropriate? To begin to understand critical race theory, we must look to its historical and theoretical underpinnings in American society. First, let's talk about the historical. One of the surest ways to create a rock-solid narrative is to teach children in schools a particular history, a particular narrative. For example, we can see this by examining the enduring legacy of the lost cause. For those unfamiliar with this phenomenon, the lost cause is an interpretation of the American Civil War, which raged from 1861 to 1865. The Lost Cause seeks to present the war from the perspective of Confederates in the best possible terms. It was developed by white Southerners, many of them former Confederate generals, in a post-war climate of economic, racial, and social uncertainty. The Lost Cause created and romanticized the Old South and the Confederate war effort, often distorting history in the process. For this reason, many historians have labeled the Lost Cause a myth or a legend. It is certainly an important example of public memory, one in which nostalgia for the Confederate past is accompanied by a collective forgetting of the horrors of slavery. It provided a sense of relief to white Southerners who feared being dishonored by defeat. The lost cause was largely accepted in the years following the war by white Americans who found it to be a useful tool in reconciling North and South. The lost cause has lost much of its academic support, but continues to be an important part of how the Civil War is commemorated in the United States of America, including how the Civil War is remembered in popular culture. The mythology of the lost cause exemplifies an enduring fact. When one adds children and schooling and politics to a mixture, one has developed a conduit for a very effective narrative strategy. One can then be sure the debate will become especially heated and volatile. Second, the theoretical underpinning. The French philosopher Louis Althusser proposed and talked about at great length his theory of ideological state apparatuses, ISAs, and the repressive state apparatus, RSA. Here we have, with critical race theory, a confluence of the two. If you would like to know more about ideological state apparatuses and the repressive state apparatus, check out our video on the topic. In Marxist theory, the state apparatus contains the government, the administration, the army, the police, the courts, the prisons, etc., all of which constitute what Althusser called the repressive state apparatus, or RSA. Of course, repressive suggests that the state apparatus in question functions by violence or the implication of violence. At least, ultimately, it is undergirded by the threat of either physical or non-physical force. On the other hand, ideological state apparatuses, or ISAs, are distinct and specialized institutions like the religious organizations, the system of the different churches, religious groups, denominations, and the like, the educational ISAs, the system of the different public and private schools as well as those organizations dedicated to education advocacy, 
the family ISA. The legal ISAs, lawyers and certification bodies like American Bar Association and other legal advocacy groups. The political ISAs, the political system including the different parties and also non-governmental agencies like think tanks. The trade union ISAs. The communications ISAs, newspapers, radio, television, the internet, technology companies and their advocacy network, etc. The cultural ISAs, literature, the arts, sports, etc. ISA must not be confused with the RSA. What constitutes the difference? The first and main difference is that while there is one RSA, the military-industrial complex, there are a plurality of ISAs and they are societally dispersed. Indeed, the unity that constitutes this plurality of ISAs as a body is not immediately visible. The second difference is that whereas the RSA belongs entirely in the public domain, ISAs are dispersed in the private domain. So churches, parties, trade unions, families, some schools, most newspapers, cultural ventures, etc., etc., these are all mostly private. So how are the lost cause mythology and Althusser's conception of RSAs and ISAs related to critical race theory? Critical race theorists believe that critical race theory is a necessary corrective to the lasting damage done by myths like the lost cause. They argue that while the lost cause doctrine is about obscuring the motivations and facts behind the Civil War, Critical race theory seeks to clarify white supremacy's influence on laws and on American society. Regardless of Althusser's theoretical suppositions, we can see that schools, school boards, superintendents, even principals and teachers are both ideological state apparatuses and in some ways repressive state apparatuses. As a result, they face questions about how to teach not only critical race theory, but indeed American history in general. There is much misinformation and disinformation in the public sphere about critical race theory. There are also significant disagreements, even among experts, about the precise definition of critical race theory, as well as how its tenets should inform K-12 policy and practice. It's important to note here that there's no evidence to show that critical race theory as an academic concept is being taught in K-12 schools, or indeed in undergraduate university. Critical race theory is taught in some graduate schools and law schools. In part two, we're going to talk about the basic tenets of critical race theory in order to help us as citizens grasp core aspects of the current debate. This includes going over the main tenets of critical race theory. We're also going to try to understand who are the people who are interested in misrepresenting the concept and what are their motivations. This is University Quick Course. Please like and subscribe.